you know what the pain of rooting for something is? Sometimes it doesn't win. Call me Mrs. What's It. Mrs. Who? No, Mrs. What's It. Mrs. Who is, oh, she's like a billion years older and way more knowledgeable. What can I do for you, Mrs. What's It? I called her Ceiling Sheets. Guys, she's harmless. You're six. Come on. What do you know about harmless? Have I ever been wrong? Well, one of these days you might be Charles Wallace. Oh, I highly doubt that. He's one of the greatest minds in recent history. He's prodigious. But of course, we can't take any credit for our talents. A Wrinkle in Time, the film adaptation of the children's book uh, authored by Madeline Lingle that many of us read growing up in school about a fantasy world full of adventure and planets and weird stuff going on. All of that which makes it a little difficult to put in movie form. But did Ava DuVernay and her crew manage to pull it off? Well, here's five things you might want to know about A Wrinkle in Time. Ah, oh, man, I was rooting for this one. Go, Ava, go. Um... She just didn't do it this time. And there are many reasons for that, and I don't know that they all fall on her, obviously. We'll get into the details, but I want to start off with the things I did like about this movie. Let's start with the positive, shall we? Uh, I think the visuals are gorgeous here. Absolutely beautiful stuff going on as far as these planets and these images and these designs. Uh, there's a way that they transport that I thought was creative, and I'd never really seen that before. There's a beauty in the costuming. There's a beauty in even the way kind of the magic of this world works. I just found everything colorful and beautiful. And I think that's a big part of what I wanted to see in the trans, you know, transformation from book to movie was bringing that vibrancy that I imagined as a kid to life. And there, I think the movie does succeed pretty well. The other part about this that I really enjoyed is the cast. I think there's some great performances here, and it's well cast at that, especially uh, Storm Reed, who plays the little girl at the center of it all. She is so good at kind of embodying the authenticity of youth, what it means to be going through that, what it means to feel like you're an outcast, all that stuff I felt she portrayed really well. Chris Pine continues to show his range. I don't know that I've seen this kind of subdued performance from him, really. Uh, other than maybe the beginning of The Finest Hours, he had a little bit of that. But he's showing that he can do all these different kinds of performances, and I really love what he's doing here. Uh, the casting all around, even uh, Gugu Mbatham Ra, I think that's how you say her name, uh, she's doing another role here. Seems like she's in everything now. And even though she's not on the screen a ton, she's so good when she is. So I enjoyed the performances in this. They were a definite plus to the movie. And here's the part where we kind of have to start digging into why this movie didn't work. Uh, I'll start with a yellow because I actually think this is where your mileage may vary uh, in this regard. The tone is really strange on this movie, and for me, this was a big negative, but I can see for you or even for a younger audience, this maybe not mattering as much or even being a positive, possibly. Here's the thing. It's just a varied tone that doesn't always match. Reese Witherspoon seems to be in some different fairy godmother-esque movie than the authentic, grounded movie that this movie seems to want to be. Like, there's these two different these things going on that are battling uh, for control of the tone of this movie. You can hear it in the pop songs that pop up in the movie in these crucial parts. I would think if you're going for that grounded reality, authentic take, which it seems like it wants to be, uh, you would maybe use score, you know, really beautiful scoring for those parts. But they use pop songs, which goes with the more lighthearted, uh, younger tone, so to speak. So that stuff was really distracting to me. I also feel like the movie in itself didn't necessarily understand what kind of movie it wanted to be. And because of that, it just distracts you and takes you out of it. But maybe for a younger audience, maybe for you, maybe it doesn't matter that much. But where this movie really starts to fall apart for me is the editing, uh, is the way it's put together. It's very jarring how this movie goes from one place to another. Characters are introduced uh, knowing nothing about them, and we never kind of get any idea of why they're a part of this story. The plot goes places without any explanation, and then never revisits places that you would think maybe it'd want to revisit. 
Uh, all of that adds up to this experience that is just all over the place. It, it just it jumps from one thing to another in drastically and dramatically in a way that is just jarring and off-putting, and I think it's probably the main flaw of the movie. Finally, let's talk about the source material. This is one instance where I actually have read the book as a kid, and I remember enjoying it. I haven't revisited it recently, so I've only seen it with my kid brain. Uh, and maybe that's part of the problem, seeing this movie with my adult brain. I think this is really hard to adapt source material. Um, the movie goes about it in such a strange way, though, uh, choosing to be very faithful to certain parts of the book that don't necessarily need to be faithful to, and leaving out certain parts of the book that seem like they could have been beneficial to painting a more cohesive picture. It's really interesting the way this movie decides to adapt the source material. Uh, impossible source material to adapt, maybe. Uh, poorly adapted source material, definitely. I think the movie struggles with it. Mm -hmm. Overall, I wanted so much more from this movie. I really wish it had been better. There are certain audiences that may be able to give themselves over to this and have a beautiful time in this fantasy world. I wasn't one of them. Uh, I gave it a C minus. Thanks for checking out this Your Movie Friend review. We'll get to the best ever challenge here in a bit. Before we do though, let's connect further. Let's hang out and talk movies. Uh, best way to do that with me is Twitter. That's my social of choice. Uh, go to twitter.com, search for Aaron Dicer, A-A-R-O-N-D-I-C-E-R. -E Love having conversations there. I do have conversations in the comments here at YouTube uh, as well, although that's a little more sporadic. Uh, so you can subscribe, leave comments here. I would love to see those, love to interact in that way. Love the community that's building here. Thank you for your subscription. Uh, and thank you for your support at patreon.com slash your movie friend. People actually giving dollar bills every month to help this thing go. Uh, I couldn't do it without you. Um, thank you so much to those who do that. Oh, and if you do podcasting, Make sure and listen to the podcast. It's called Sif Pop, S I F T P O P. If you've got a podcast player that you use, just search for it. You should find it pretty quick. All right, on to the best ever challenge where you name the best movie ever in a particular category. Also, try to identify my choice. Uh, let's go best ever Chris Pine movies. What is the best ever Chris Pine movie? Um, I'm going to have to go with the one that, if I'm taking the choice the title gives me, uh, I'm going with The Flood every single time. Not even a second thought. Take a guess at mine in the comments. First person to get it right, by the way, does get a point. I'd love to hear your choice as well. As always, here's a few extra seconds to hit subscribe. Just click my face.